you know what's happening, right? We're being hobbited. A successful film franchise being milked for all it's worth by making more prequels than necessary that will most likely try and set up at least a part of the conflict for the main series, which is kind of pointless because it's already over. Or maybe we're being phantom menaced. Hello everyone, Scrivener here. The final trailer for Fantastic Beasts 2 The Crimes of Grindelwald was released last week. It's funny because literally the night before this trailer came out, I had been ruminating on my relationship with the world of Harry Potter and how it's deteriorated in recent years. And I realized that the last time Paige and I mentioned Harry Potter on this channel was 2016. So this seemed like a good opportunity. JK Rowling is a good writer. She is especially good at mystery and world building, though these are the very things that she is now doing way too much of. Many adults love her books because they're good books and not just because they loved them as children. But for people my age, it goes a bit deeper than that. The release of the books and then the films have spanned practically our entire childhood and adolescence. So seeing Rowling's bigotry surface feels more like we've been betrayed by a family friend than some long gone, it was a different time author like Dr. Seuss or Roald Dahl. Now, I don't think retconning is inherently bad. I think that when done right, an author can strengthen their work in a genuine way by engaging with fans about their past mistakes. Rolling more often than not skips that last part. For example, in 2014, she was asked by a Jewish fan if there were Jewish students at Hogwarts, and she responded with the name of one of the kids in Harry's year, and then went on to say that she imagined everyone being able to go to Hogwarts. That's great and all, but she never addresses the fact that this question is asked because despite having a hospital named after a saint and Hogwarts celebrating Christmas and Easter, there is little to no mention of organized religion in the books, and that creates a lack of representation. By not addressing the initial mistake, it essentially comes off as, I should get credit for this, even though I never actually represented anything. When we consume media, we interpret it in our own unique ways. Some things are undeniably canon, but there is room for interpretation in everything. And the more you pick out the in-between spaces that people can fill with themselves, the more you force out the people who love your work the most because they see themselves in it. That's a problem any writer who is either pressed into or just feels the need to explain everything can run into. In this final trailer, it's revealed that Nagini, Voldemort's pet snake who was also a horcrux, has a backstory. In the 1920s, she was an Asian lady working in a circus. She has some sort of blood curse that only women get that causes her to turn into a snake, and right now she can shift between lady and snake, but eventually she'll permanently become a snake. Some people think this is a creative, mind-blowing plot twist. I am not one of those people. I think the moment that you introduce people turning into animals in your fantasy setting, which is in the very first chapter of the very first book, let alone when you explore werewolves at length, the idea that some people might be cursed into animals is not that much of a leap. Also, it's not really a plot twist because it doesn't really matter. Nagini used to be a person. So what? And sure, Rowling is a good mystery writer. I have no doubt that Nagini's story could be very well written and tragic in a vacuum, but it wouldn't change the fact that one, it's really racist, and two, before last week, none of us cared about the tragic backstory of Nagini the evil, creepy, murderous, giant pet snake of the villain because she's a giant, murderous, creepy pet snake that's evil and gets beheaded at the end in a very satisfying manner. How much can we really care? Rowling says that she's had the idea of Nagini being a cursed woman instead of an intelligent magic snake for 20 years. Some people do not believe her. I do. I believe that JK Rowling has held on to this idea for 20 years because I have no trouble believing that she has been having terrible, racist, and terribly racist ideas for 20 years. What I don't know is if Rowling has always had the race of the character worked out. We know she took the word from Hindu and Buddhist religion, which she categorizes as Indonesian mythology, which is not only detrimentally vague, but also is kind of like referring to Christianity as American legends. Did she originally plan for Nagini to be a default white lady and then changed her mind because of the critique her Asian representation in the books has received? Or did she always just think, and the evil murdering pet snake of villain wizard terrorist will be an Asian woman? And it honestly never occurred to her why either route could make her look really bad. And I genuinely do not know which one is worse. Because it means one of three things. One, 
that she thought this would be meaningful representation that people would appreciate. Two, that she's completely unaware that she's replicating racist tropes. Or three, that she just thought the Asian woman was perfectly suited to being the subservient, cunning, evil slave pet of the villain. There's not a good option here. And just to make sure I don't mince any words here, Nagini's story could be the most perfectly crafted and devastating thing ever written, and it still wouldn't make it not racist because her ending has already been written and it is irredeemable. You don't get to try and vindicate the villain's murdering pet with sad woman of color backstory and it not have racist implications. It's not possible. Nagini is not the only bad or racist writing decision she's ever made. It's not even the only bigoted side she's ever revealed. It's just the latest. In 2016, there was a lot of anger from Native American writers and activists regarding the Pottermore chapters she wrote about the Native American magical community because she had so wildly misrepresented an incredibly diverse group of people by identifying them all as one group and also falling back on lazy, racist, and imperialist stereotypes. Last fall and this spring, she's been caught liking very transphobic tweets. For the transphobic stuff, we got a statement, not even directly from her, but from a representative, that she'd had a middle-aged moment of accidentally liking a tweet. Really? Twice? Also, even if that is true, why is this stuff on your feed for you to accidentally like in the first place, Rolling? As for the Native American stuff, Nothing. It's been two years, and she never even acknowledged that she'd done something wrong. So it seems that she does understand how the power of not addressing everything can benefit her. However, it is very important to her that she speak up to defend Johnny Depp's continued employment in her movies because she thinks he's a really good person, despite the fact that he is a violent man who beat his ex-wife because he's an insecure, biphobic jerk. I have to wonder if she just doesn't believe women, or if she's really just that homophobic that she thinks Amber Heard deserved the abuse she got. A writer is put into a dangerous position when they return to their most beloved work due to popular demand. Not just because when you expand on a finished story you have to make sure that everything matches up and still makes sense, but because artists are people too, with egos and weaknesses that will absolutely rear their head in the worst possible way if left unchecked. Rowling captures the British boarding school story pretty well. I can only assume she captures England pretty well too. She does alright. But she's very lucky that the experience she knows so well just happens to be relevant to a very small country. Because if she'd been tasked with a place any bigger than England, I think she would have run into some serious world building issues. She certainly hasn't pulled it off anywhere else. I don't expect Rowling to innately know everything about other cultures. But research is your responsibility as a writer. You have to do more than just recollect what you learned in middle school. Oh, just in case she's watching this. Middle school is the educational period between elementary and high school that covers 6th through 8th grade, when kids are roughly 11 to 13 years old. Middle schools do exist throughout much of the world, but my specific definition is shaped by the fact that I grew up in the United States. However, this isn't necessarily the case for every single American child either, because sometimes schools go from K to 6th or 7th to 12th. The K stands for kindergarten, which takes place after preschool. This is the kind of thing you can learn by talking to the people who actually live here. Any of your American fans could have told you that one school would not be enough for everyone because your whole country could fit in my state, unless you're implying that there wouldn't be as many American wizards because we're just not cut out for it, that boarding schools for this age group aren't very common for us, that no match is the most British thing we've ever heard, and that we would never share a school with Canada! The worst thing is that Rowling doesn't seem to even recognize that her very basic knowledge isn't enough to write these things well. She seems to think she can pluck anything she finds on Wikipedia to use it as set decoration for her own story, and that by putting it in her fictional world, she can pass it off as world building. Two years ago, I made my first Plat and Prejudice episode about Rowling's misrepresentation of American indigenous peoples on Pottermore. A thing I was able to make because I actually read things that actual Native Americans wrote about the subject. The color correction is garbage! But you know what whiny comment babies wanted to critique me on? That Rowling's offensive treatment of indigenous culture wasn't a big deal because Harry Potter isn't real. Wow. My mind. It's blown. But have you told JK Rowling that? Harry Potter is fictional. The wizarding world is fictional, but the things that she's been inspired by and just flat out stolen without acknowledging that she didn't come up with it herself, 
are not fictional. There are real people who have stereotypes and perceptions thrust upon them by a white British woman who doesn't even have the decency to admit when she makes damaging mistakes or explain how what she wrote is inspired by but isn't an actually accurate representation of a culture. And there are lots of people who have no clue that these things aren't another piece of fiction because she so rarely clarifies where her invention begins and where reality ends. When I read a manuscript and give feedback to an author, my job isn't to fix their writing issues. It's to point them out so that they can fix it. And the idea that the most successful writer in the world needs me to come up with solutions for her is very silly. But let it not be said that I am not a very nice person. So here's some advice. Do more research. Skimming through Encyclopedia Britannica's entry on Hinduism isn't enough. If you actually care about respecting a culture, your process should include involving the people whose culture it is. Why not make these new stories a more collaborative effort? Different perspectives and opinions don't damage what you've already created, they strengthen and revitalize it. And besides, it's not like anyone can do worse than Cursed Child. Or what you're doing. Some mysteries do not need to be clarified, and if you're going to retroactively give us representation, don't be surprised when you write new things and people expect you to actually do it from the start. I have loved the Harry Potter books for a significant portion of my life, and I still love them. I do not love the mistakes and oversights in the books, and I would be lying if I said that Rowling's actions now have had no impact on my opinion of the original series. Some of the magic is gone, and I will never get it back. Because when I go back and read them, I can see where certain things aren't some unfortunate prejudice she had 20 years ago that she's since moved past. Instead, it shows me that she hasn't grown at all. She is ruining it, and it's so terrible because it's truly a great thing. No matter what she says after the fact, she can't change what she did publish. And it's okay to hold on to that. Just don't let that fool you into giving her more than she deserves. Thanks for watching. Wanted to let y'all know that VidCon US has opened up their suggestion form for creators you want to see at VidCon 2019. I've already submitted my picks, including Annie Segara, Nerd Sync, Just Right, and Dead Me. They are all good friends of ours, and they all talk about media in a critical way, which I would love to see more representation of at VidCon. The best way to get creators you like invited to these events is to let the organizers know that there is a demand, so we hope you'll go and suggest The Princess and the Scrivener. If you're really feeling it, let them know you want us to do a panel. Even if you can't attend, there will undoubtedly be someone who films it. Thanks again for watching. The princess will see you real soon.